Um, so we're going to move on to our final speaker, who is Dr. Will Lamb, who is an authority on Gaelic linguistics and oral traditions. He is currently a senior lecturer in Scottish ethnology at Edinburgh University, but as of August, he will be the personal chair of Gaelic ethnology and linguistics. Um, Dr. Lamb and his team of researchers have developed the first working example of automatic speech recognition um, for Scottish Gaelic, which is no mean feat, I can assure you. Um, he is here to discuss the process involved and what the future holds for our Gaelic broadcasters. So, hello, Will. I'm going to try this. Kimana Hashif. More and thank. Thank you. Good pronunciation. Um, <laughs> shall I share my screen? Please, thank you. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so, thank you very much uh, to begin with to Jennifer Wilson for the kind invitation to to join you today. Um, I was really interested to. Oh, it's a, it's a great kind of benefit of being the last one to speak because you can kind of pull upon or pull on the things that. Uh, the previous folk have talked about, and um, it was wonderful hearing the work that Bernard was describing for Romanche. Um, the Scottish Gaelic, uh, as I'll talk about in a second, uh, is in a kind of similar position. I mean, it's a minority language in Scotland, as probably most of you know. Um, it actually has a similar number of speakers. So we've got just slightly less speakers um, in Scotland than you would have of Romanche. So we've got just under 60,000 speakers and kind of a similar number of people who understand it as well. I can't remember what the last census was, but maybe around 90,000 or so. Um, and like Romance, Gaelic is an under-resourced language when it comes to language technology. Um, so that's the area that I've been working on uh, in part for the last 10 years or so. Um, again, like Bernard, we've been working on uh, speech to text over the last two years. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, today. So um, we've developed, a, you know, a large number of, of tools, but I think it, it occurred to us at some point um, that ASR, so automatic speech recognition, was really the key type of technology that we needed to develop um, going forward for a number of reasons. Um, Gaelic is a written language. It has been a written language for a long, long time. And it's probably one of the most, um, probably one of the oldest um, literate languages in Europe after Latin and Greek, um, written down first probably around 400 AD or so. But at the same time, I mean, the, the vast number of speakers through the history of language have been illiterate. Um, and even today, literacy levels vary. Um, they, they're better than they used to be, but still a lot of people can speak Gaelic who aren't very comfortable writing it. So um, to be able to provide subtitles, to be able to engage with the language community, etc., cetera, um, and to really, you know, put Gaelic on the map when it comes to NLP um, and to help the language thrive in the future, it was really important to go down this, this path. So I'm going to today outline the importance of ASR um, and how it could be used to enhance record indexing and retrieval in media and academic archives. So the questions that I look at are, what is the state of the art for Gaelic automatic speech recognition and why it's important? How can recognition technology assist archival research in media and academia? And what lessons have been learned so far and what future plans exist? First off, I mean, this is probably not, uh, not news to anybody here, but NLP, you know, what is it? It's often described as the combination of linguistics and informatics. Um, basically, it's enabling computers to understand natural human language, whether it's speech, writing, or sign language. Um, it can take many different forms, but today we're going to be looking at uh, speech recognition. So um, I don't need to talk about this very much So because Bernard um, and Olivia uh, talked about it for me. So I think everyone understands what's going on here in terms of what the technology is trying to do. So. I'll discuss briefly why ASR is important for the Gaelic language community and then for media and archival groups specifically. First off, uh, why is it important for the Gaelic community? Well, I mean, the pandemic catalyzed changes that were already afoot in human uh, society. A huge amount of our communication is either technologically mediated, so 
human to computer to human, like today, or it has the computer as the addressee. And with the rise of you know, computational conversational agents, it won't be long until computers are prompting us for responses, will be the addressees. Currently, that type of text, or tech rather, is overwhelmingly geared to well-resourced majority languages. Gallic is already a threatened language, so it stands to reason that you either open up um, opportunities for using it in digital communication or English, in our case, has an even bigger share of the linguistic real estate. ASR is part of the bedrock of any speech technology system, so we either get this right or Gallic will be left standing on the sidelines. So why is it important for archives and the media in Scotland? Well, due to all of the wonderful digitization efforts of the past two decades, as our um, previous two speakers um, talked about for us, uh, we now have a huge kind of big data problem. Digitizing is the easy bit of this, but finding out what's actually in all those files is the hard bit. So let's say that you've digitized a massive paper-based folklore ar archive like the one that we've got in Edinburgh at the School of Scottish Studies Archives. And you want to pull up all the files that mention, let's just say, and this is kind of random, but witches. Let's say you're doing, um, let's say you're doing a media piece, you know, a, a piece on television or radio about uh, witch trials and you want to talk about witches in Scottish folklore. So how would you get a hold of all of those uh, cases where witches are mentioned? I mean, you could, you know, look at the index uh, that was provided, hopefully, um, in the folklore archive, but that won't actually get you to every record that mentions the word witch or witches. Um, so there's no system right now that would, that would allow you to do that. If you're dealing with a paper-based archive, you could use optical character recognition and handwriting recognition um, after you convert all those, um, you know, paper um, manuscripts uh, to computer-readable text and then you take all those TIFF images and turn them into searchable text. But let's say you've got um, a sound archive. How would you do that? It's a little bit more complicated, obviously. Think about the size of the archives at the BBC. And I'm just talking about the Gaelic part of the BBC. Um, so you might have one daily radio program that's run for 30 years, where you've got upwards of 5,000 hours of audio. So how would you tell what's in each of those episodes? You could pay somebody to listen to each audio file and summarize it, but of course that would be very expensive. But you could also use speech recognition to generate a usable list of the most frequent words and phrases for each episode. Um, a human could do that more effectively, or a group of humans, but the computational approach would be vastly quicker and cheaper. So I was dealing with these two problems, dealing with you know folklore archives on the one hand and extracting metadata and indexing and eventually generating transcriptions and also dealing with you know sound archives like you have in video archives at the bbc um and at the school of scottish studies archives um to be able to do that with audio so those are the kind of the that, that was the impetus for for this work so i'll talk a little bit now about what we've done and where we hope to go with it so th as i mentioned the speech recognition project began uh, about two years ago and there were three goals as part of this project. Um, first, to automatically index Gallic audio, which is um, on a scale of easy to hard, that's probably an easier task. Automatically transcribe Gallic audio. Well, that's kind of a harder task. And then to generate live Gallic subtitles, that would be the hardest task because you can't uh, allow the computer to kind of churn through the data and figure out what's the best way of approaching it. You have to do that on the cuff um, while the program is airing. Currently, all of the subtitles that are produced in Gallic, on Gallic TV are in English. So, um, you know, for all of those Gallic speakers, whether they're learners or maybe, you know, hard of hearing who would like Gallic subtitles, um, that's not a possibility right now. But if we were able to train a system that could do this, then it would open up, you know, a new world for all these people. So how do we do that? I'll talk a little bit, I'm not gonna to get too technical here, um, but I'll talk a little bit about how this works in terms of the different components that are required. So our system was built using um, three things, uh, three main things, a phonetic lexicon, an acoustic model. I'm sorry, a phonetic lexicon which fed into a, an acoustic model. Um, so basically a phonetic lexicon is a list of words and their phonetic pronunciations. 
and those are in the international phonetic alphabet. Um, so those go into the, uh, they, they help to build an acoustic model so that you can take, um, you can basically ingest um, a knowledge of the, of those pronunciations, a knowledge of you know what what Gaelic sounds like basically. Um, we also had uh, we use textual data, so we have um, a huge amount of textual data, at least for a small language like Gaelic, and use that to make a language model. And a language model um, basically um, is what you get in predictive text. So if you have a sequence of words, a language model will help you to predict the next most likely word. So if you had um, the United States of, then you would hope an English language model would uh, output America, given that input. And then finally, um, a huge number of um, recordings, so audio recordings, as well as transcriptions of those recordings, which again help to produce the acoustic model. So um, I've got a, a graph here, which will maybe make this a little bit more clear. So teaching a machine learning system to understand spoken language, whether it's Gaelic or another language, is pretty similar to teaching a child to do it. Um, you've got to expose them to a lot of speech and context, and eventually they build up a knowledge of which sounds represent which words and a memory for which words go with other words. So our system takes a speech waveform as an input, and then it tries to work out which speech sounds are represented in that waveform. And it does that using the acoustic model which is, again, a representation of the language's phonology. The system then tries to match those sounds to individual words using the lexicon. And then it tries to, to uh, constrain which words uh, might be possible using its knowledge of the language, which is uh, generated from the language model. In order to quickly teach the computer um, the relationships between Gaelic sounds and their textual representation, we used a process called forced alignment and uh, i put up a, uh, uh, a question there for bernard to ask if, if his team has have been using that we found that to be a really quick way of building up our um our training data and what's involved is basically um presenting the computer with a, a reliable transcription of a piece of audio and then telling the computer to go and basically timestamp the audio using the transcription there's some steps involved to get to that point, but once you've gotten there, it's it's a pretty effective way to to generate your training data. So, talk, to talk about our training data, um, we've got about 103, nearly 104 hours of audio, um, and all of that is transcribed. So we've got the audio and the text, and then text without audio will run about 8.6 billion words. So compared to a state-of-the-art system in English or in French or Spanish or whatever. This is actually um, a very small amount of training data. And we've got similar problems to Romanche um, because you've got a lot of different dialects in Gaelic. Currently our system, uh, which is in the prototype phase, can deal pretty well with um, clear audio in the Uist or Sky dialects, but it struggles a bit with um, Lewis Gaelic. And that's a, a bit of a problem for us because most of the speakers today are Lewis speakers, but um, most of the training data that we got, uh, which came from the folklore archive I mentioned, as well as the BBC and a series of um, conversations that were recorded in the Western Isles from uh, from an academic over the last couple of years. Um, all of that is, is very highly geared towards um, the US dialects. So I'll just give you a brief clip of the system in action. Um, and this is from a South US speaker. Um, I don't know if any of you have Gaelic, probably not, but anyway, um, you can maybe work out uh, the relationship between the sound of the language and uh, the words that are being produced. And please just let me know if you don't hear anything. I hope I've set this up correctly. As Misha Madanish Ginesh, Agus Lukogmi as Nirker, Fask is three fichet as Jay, Blionadash. Hamakinjach Gerel will me do an a Berkhog Sismurgeon is a Nimatach Shorrut Hachad Namaveha, Agas Jol or Sahomi, a Nimatach Rut. Ah, Hanur and me gonna be do an tangel, Homa Seva Veha on a Nimatach Imatach Doi. The look of me, Harawanach Glevic de Blionachan as Joey a hockey. 
get a half hour again, you know, the version of fast suits as a yoker. Girl, that hocker with me on, have a mutual clinging goo itch it at cocker. Agus. Okay, so that's just a wee demo uh, where the system is right now. Um, <clears throat> looking at that, I'm just sitting there trying to calculate, you know, the accuracy and just to, just to eyeball it. Um, <clears throat> but I'd say it's somewhere around 90% for that, if not slightly higher. Um, in general, our system is getting uh, a word error rate of somewhere around 27%, I think. Um, so it's an accuracy of about, <clears throat> pardon me, about 73, 74%. We're doing really well with just over 100 hours of data. And of course, as you increase your training data, so anyway, that's where we are right now, where we were in 2021. As you increase your training data, um, of course, you're going to do better. But there are diminishing gains. So if you look here, you know, there's a massive jump between, say, 15 hours of data and 100, of hour, 100 hours of data. So, you've, you know, you've dropped your word error rate um, by 10% or so. But to go from, say, 20, you know, a word error rate of 24 to, let's say, 14 requires probably more like 2,000 hours of data. We're hoping to be somewhere around here in the next two years. Um, getting good data is very hard with a minority language. Um, fortunately, fortunately, we've been helped by numerous community groups, archives, and businesses such as um, MG Alapa, which is a, the com main commissioning body for GAT TV, and also uh, the BBC and the School of Scottish Studies Archives. So what lessons have we learned? Well, the biggest one is that it takes a long time to form relationships with data gatekeepers and also a long time to source funding. So you have to be very tenacious on both accounts. On a technical level, um, an interesting lesson is that it's best to have variety in your training set. So going back to the the problems that I mentioned with recognizing Lewis Gaelic versus U US Gaelic or Sky Gaelic. Um, we were offered a huge amount of data from one narrator, and I was kind of excited about that at one point, but then speaking with my colleagues, uh, we all agreed it would, it would have skewed our tools towards that one accent and voice, threatening generalizability. But uh, at the same time, um, when you're doing this kind of work, particularly with a lesser resource lang language, it's important to use what you have. The challenge or the various challenges that uh, we have, I guess the biggest one is data. Um, so getting the training data is uh, really um, a massive challenge. That's got to be clean, at least in the beginning and in the right format. And you want it to be varied enough. Um, my goal for the weekend is to write a script in Python that will automatically grab all of the um, 11 a.m. Gaelic news bulletins over the last 15 years from the BBC's web pages and extract the text and audio. And if uh, I manage to do that, that would double our training data. Um, the second biggest challenge is getting someone to pay for research assistance. This is applied research, essentially, so it doesn't really fit with the academic funding structures that we're used to in the university. But we're hopeful that the Scottish government and Borsh and the Gaelic, the Gaelic funding body, uh, will continue to support us in the years to come. Another challenge is dealing with the large amount of English content in any Gaelic discourse, which we've estimated to be about 10%. I'd be interested to know um, from our previous two speakers if bilingualism or maybe trilingualism is an issue in, um, in their own ASR training. If your training models can't cope with loan words and code switching, then your accuracy is gonna suffer a lot. So we're looking at ways to deal with bilingual data more efficiently efficiently and effectively right now. So what's next? Um, we're currently working with the BBC uh, to design a live sub subtitling system that could be used for radio and TV or streamed content. And we hope to have that ready in three to five years. Um, we'd also like to use our system to help coach learners to pronounce Gaelic more effectively. That kind of tech technology could be embedded, for in instance, in uh, Duolingo. Um, which um, at the moment has just over 1 million learners of Gaelic, if you can believe it. So that's what we hope to do in the future. Just a quick note of thanks to our funders and to acknowledge um, the research team and our external partners and the University of Edinburgh's Compute and Data Facility. 
Um, this is to, to bring us to a close. Here's a taste of our prototype web system in action. Um, it's a pleasure, and I, I look forward to hearing any questions or comments you might have. Hamian and Dolchus can the horse and the Shahuladinia. Moran Tain, give Uluk. That was that was great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, it's so interesting, as someone noted in um, the Q and A, that the quality of the results that you're getting back are just as good as those for a long-standing language like English, you know, where there's been a lot of research and a lot of money has gone into those systems in comparison with the Gaelic and with the Romance systems, the results you guys are getting back are just as good with far less um, far less money, far less time. <laughs> you know? Everything's it's, relative. It's really impressive. <laughs> well, I mean, just, just to say something about that, um, I mean, we certainly aren't at the point that, that we're getting results as good as English. Um, nowhere near it, I mean, really. But you're talking, you, when, you, when you're looking at English, uh, some people who are training models with English have at their disposal 10,000 10, hours, 100,000 hours, over a million hours of speech yeah. data. We're working with 100. Um, but, you know, it's going to take uh, orders of magnitude well above what we've got to actually get close to human parity, which now does more or less exist for, for English. But but yeah, that's a, that's a nice comment. It's nice to hear. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to say thank you to all our uh, presenters today. Um, one of the overriding points that I think has come out of it is um, how important cooperation is in the creation of our, our automated archives, you know, whether that's cooperation between different departments or different organizations or different external bodies every one of you have 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 created something via a cooperative kind of way of working which is is nice to see it's a really good thing to see it's not about everyone being siloed in their own little spaces